Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to be addressing a very common question that we've been getting this year about a major accounting change. As you can see, that change is the fact that under both US GAAP and IFRS, operating leases must now be listed directly on companies' balance sheets. So the typical question we get goes something like this. Help, companies are now reporting operating leases on their balance sheets because of IFRS 16 and ASC 842, two new accounting rules that took effect in 2019. How does this affect accounting and valuation and financial statement analysis? Do I add operating leases to calculate enterprise value now? So as usual, I'm going to give you a very quick answer. Then we're going to go into this in more depth and we will go through an Excel file and do a side-by-side -side comparison between the old system and the new systems for leases under both IFRS and US GAAP. We'll also look at some valuation multiples and we will look at how real companies like EasyJet and Target are applying these new rules in real life. So here's the short answer. Under both major accounting systems, companies now report operating leases as liabilities on their balance sheet, and then they re report corresponding assets called rate of use assets, or sometimes they lump them together with PP&E, plants, property, and equipment, on the asset side of the balance sheet. Now, under US GAAP, companies still record operating lease rent as an operating expense on the income statement. But under IFRS, companies now split the old rental expense on leases into depreciation and interest components, separate components on the income statement. Depreciation shows up within operating expenses. Interest expense, of course, shows up within other income or expenses below the operating income line on the income statement. But despite these changes, most companies' net income and net change in cash figures and ending cash figures barely change. It's still the same total expense over the course of a lease, it's just that it's presented a little bit differently and shown in different spots on the financial statements now. The tricky part is that as I record this in the middle of 2019, companies are still transitioning or they're still restating their old financial statements and some are transitioning slightly differently, some are restating their old statements differently, and some companies are choosing not to restate their old statements at all. In terms of valuation, you can add operating leases to calculate enterprise value now. So you can treat them as a debt-like item because they're listed as a debt-like item on the balance sheet. But if you do that, then you must exclude the income statement expenses associated with the leases in the denominator of whatever valuation multiple you're creating, such as in EBIT or EBITDA, for example. What this means is that under US GAAP, effectively, if you want to add operating leases in the enterprise value calculation, then you're going to have to use a metric like EBITDAR or EBITDER. I'm not even sure that's a real metric, but you get the idea. Essentially, you have to add back the entire lease expense, the entire rental expense on the income statement if you are going to count operating leases as debt. Under IFRS, you have less of a choice. You pretty much have to count operating leases as debt. And so anything where total enterprise value is in the numerator, we'll have to have operating leases added. And that means that you need to pair it with a metric like EBITDA or EBITDA because both of those completely exclude the operating lease expense since they exclude interest and depreciation. EBIT is now a bit of a problematic metric and I don't see how you can really fully apply it under IFRS now because EBIT by definition will only include part of the lease expense. It won't exclude the full thing or include the full thing, unlike EBITDA or EBITDA. So it seems like you cannot really use this one with enterprise value anymore. Let's now go into the longer answer and go through some of the topics that I mentioned before. So first we'll go through how these changes work based on a hypothetical airline company's financial statements. Then we'll look at how Target in the US and EasyJet in the UK are applying these rules or transitioning to them. Then we'll look at the impact on valuation multiples and metrics. And then we'll go through a quick summary of operating leases in financial models and the main points that we covered here. Let's start with this airline ABC's financial statements. And I'll pull it up on screen right now. We have three main columns, the old pre-2019 system, the new system under IFRS 16, and then the new system under US GAAP, which corresponds to ASC 842 within US GAAP. So on the income statement in the old system, we had the rental expense on operating leases. We had nothing for depreciation and amortization on the right of use assets because they didn't exist. And we had nothing for the interest component of operating leases. 
Under US GAAP, in the new system, it's pretty much the same. We still have operating lease rent, we still have nothing for new DNA, and we still have nothing for the interest component. Where it's different is with IFRS 16, because now we split that old 35 expense into 25 of depreciation and amortization, and 10 for the interest component of operating leases. So in total, they still add up to about the same amount as the old system, the 35 right there. As a result of this, pre-tax income and net income stay the same or very close to the same, but many of the other metrics here change, such as EBIT and EBITDA, and interestingly, EBITDA is the same under all three systems. So I have a summary in slide format here, but effectively, EBIT, EBITDA, and EBITDA all stay the same under US GAAP. It doesn't matter whether you're using the pre-2019 system or the 2019 and onward system. Under IFRS, EBIT and EBITDA increase because you are now excluding components of the operating lease expense, but EBITDA stays the same because this completely excludes everything relating to leases under both the new and the old systems. On the balance sheet, let's scroll down and take a look at this. So on the asset side, you will now see a new item called right of use assets from operating leases or right of use assets or leased assets or something like that. Some companies might also group this together with net pp &E. So the presentation varies a little bit, but you'll see something there. On the other side, you will see operating lease liabilities. These could also be called lease liabilities or various other names, but you get the idea. And then there will also be some type of adjustment to equity to account for this because the lease liabilities are not necessarily going to be exactly equal to the right of use assets. So you have to make some adjustment in equity to account for that. Now the total amount of the right of use assets may be slightly different under both systems because there are different methodologies and different ways to recognize these assets. We're not going to get into it for now, but just keep in mind that you will see some small differences as a result of that. Now on the cash flow statement under IFRS, cash flow from operations increases because we have the same net income, the same existing depreciation and amortization, but now we have a new depreciation and amortization line item on the right of use assets. And you can see that right here. Cash flow from operations is the same under US GAAP and the old system, but it's higher under IFRS 16. Nothing in cash flow from investing changes. And then in cash flow from financing activities, we have a new item here, the repayment of the capital element of operating leases under IFRS. Now in this case, it offsets depreciation. So it's negative 25 here, which offsets the depreciation of positive 25. And so the net change in cash ends up being about the same. The ending cash balance is also the same. That won't necessarily always happen quite like that, but usually there's going to be a relatively modest impact on the net change in cash and the ending cash balance. And as I say here, net income, the net change in cash, and ending cash stay the same or pretty much close to the same under the old system and the new systems. Again, remember, these rules just change the presentation of the lease expense, not its total amount. So if a company leases something and pays $100 per year over 10 years, that's still going to be an expense of $1,000 over those 10 years. It's just that it's going to show up slightly differently at different times and in different places on the statements. Let's go to part two now and talk about how real companies are doing this and how they're treating these new expenses. So with Target, let's go to their statements first. They make very clear that the operating lease expense is just a component of their selling general and administrative expense on the income statement. And you can tell that because if you scroll down and you go to page five here, under lease costs, they tell us directly that the operating lease cost is directly within the SGNA expense. Now, after that, on the balance sheet, we see operating leased assets or operating lease assets, and then we see operating lease liabilities. And as I said, they're not exactly equal. And so we're going to have some type of adjustment here for equity. They're also counting operating leases as invested capital, and they're adding back a portion of the lease expense as the interest component in one of the calculations required for return on invested capital for the NOPAT calculation. And you can see this if you go to the first page here, they're adding back a portion of the operating lease expense. And they're also counting all these operating lease liabilities as a debt-like item in the invested capital calculation. This is mostly for comparison purposes for companies that follow IFRS or for companies that use all capital leases rather than operating leases and that therefore have much higher allocations to depreciation and interest from these leases. Now, if you look at EasyJet, 
let's go to their statements and see how they're doing this. So it's a little bit different here because they don't just have one single line item for rent. If you look at their IFRS 16 impact column, they had split rent across the maintenance and aircraft dry leasing categories before. They have now modified both of these and made them much lower and then increased depreciation as a result. It goes up over 100 million from 116 to 228. And then interest payable also increases because we now have interest or the interest element of these operating leases. On the balance sheet, let's go down and take a look at this. We have a big increase to pp &E. Not really a big increase, but it goes up by around 10%. They're not separating it into separate right of use assets. They're just listing everything within pp &E. And then on the other side, we have lease liabilities, non-current and current portions. And we have some type of adjustment to equity as well. You can see it's a little bit different now because the new lease liabilities don't exactly equal the new lease assets. On the cash flow statement, let's go down and take a look at this. We now have net income that's slightly lower, but that's mostly because of other things, not really IFRS 16. Depreciation is now higher. And then interest, which they're also listing here in a somewhat roundabout way, has also increased because there's now an interest element of these capital leases. And if you go down under cash flow from financing, now we have a repayment of the capital element of leases arising under IFRS 16, which of course did not exist before under the old system. So that's how EasyJet is doing this. For their equivalent metric to return on invested capital, which they call return on capital employed, they're doing something slightly different, which we'll get into in the next part. So let's go to part three now and talk about valuation multiples and key metrics and ratios. Valuation is pretty clear because if you treat operating leases as debt and enterprise value, then you need to add back all the corresponding lease expenses on the income statement in metrics like EBITDA. So what this means is that under IFRS, you need to add operating leases enterprise value unless you want to make a bunch of manual adjustments to metrics like EBITDA. So here, for example, in our file, when we do not treat operating leases as debt, then none of these multiples, enterprise value to EBIT, EBITDA or EBITDA really makes sense under IFRS because all these metrics are excluding part of or all of the entire lease expense. But if we don't count it as debt in the numerator, we have a mismatch. If we count something in the numerator, we have to completely exclude it in the denominator. So what makes sense under IFRS is EBITDA and EBITDA and to count operating leases as debt. You can see the difference in our calculations right here. We get to an enterprise value that's quite a bit higher when we do that. And when we get that higher number, we can then pair it with metrics like EBITDA, which completely exclude everything associated with leases. And when we do that, we just take our enterprise value, including those operating leases, and then we divide it by any metric, EBITDA and EBITDA under IFRS, which completely exclude the lease expense on the income statement. Under US GAAP, you could still use traditional metrics like enterprise value to EBITDA, enterprise value to EBIT, but if you add operating leases to enterprise value, you have to use enterprise value to EBITDA for your valuation multiples. And you can see it down here. If you don't treat operating leases as debt, those traditional metrics are fine. But if you do treat them as debt, these no longer make sense because you have to exclude the entire lease expense, which means that you need to use enterprise value to EBITDA. That's the only one that really makes sense under US GAAP when you add these operating leases. Returns-based metrics like return on invested capital and return on capital employed are tricky because companies define them a little bit differently. But invested capital or capital employed is usually defined as average shareholders equity plus debt minus cash plus operating leases, or you capitalize the operating leases if they're not yet shown on the balance sheet. But the operating income number you use to calculate NOPAT must exclude the interest element of operating leases, even if the company uses US GAAP. Let's go in and take a look at this on target statements. You can see it right here. They're taking operating income or EBIT, and then they're adding back only a portion of the operating lease expense here. And they're saying this is the portion that would correspond to interest if they recognize leases and split the expense into interest versus depreciation. So they're adding this back so that only the depreciation affects EBIT. And then they're calculating invested capital the way I just laid out. They're taking the average number and they're dividing no pat net operating profit after taxes by this average invested capital to get the return on invested capital. Now, if you go to EasyJet's statements, they are doing something similar. They're taking the average shareholders equity, the average debt, subtracting the average cash, 
they are taking the average capitalized leases in the old system. In the new system, they don't have to do that because the leases, they're just counting as net debt right here. And then what they're doing is just taking the headline loss before interest and tax. So in other words, they're just taking the operating income directly from the income statement and using that. They no longer need to add back this interest element of operating lease payments because now under the new system, this is simply not part of operating income at all. It's shown below operating income. And so we don't need to add anything back or make any adjustments there. And then they're still taking this, dividing by the average capital employed to get the return on capital employed. So you can take a look at their filings to see this in action. The bottom line is that you just have to be careful about this and you have to be consistent with how you do it because companies themselves are not even consistent on this point sometimes. Let's do a summary now of operating leases and financial models and do a recap of everything that we covered here. With the projections, nothing here is really complicated or extremely difficult. I explained how the lease expense shows up differently, but you can still make all these numbers simple percentages of revenue. You can make the leases grow at a certain percentage growth rate. The only difference under IFRS is that you record two items, interest and depreciation, rather than just one item. On a balance sheet, the lease assets and the lease liabilities can be linked to the income statement line item. So this might be a percentage of the income statement line item, and then you might make lease liabilities a percentage of lease assets. Something simple like that works. Depreciation under IFRS, the new one from the right of use assets, you just add back from what's on the income statement. And then the repayment of the capital element of operating leases, again, you can just make it offset the new depreciation, or you can make it a simple percent of revenue or grow it at a simple percentage growth rate or something like that. With valuation, if you add operating leases and enterprise value, you must pair it with metrics like EBITDA that exclude all portions of the lease expense on the income statement. To reduce confusion, we actually think that EBITDA is probably the best overall metric to use now and that you should always add operating leases in total enterprise value, especially when you're dealing with companies that have a significant amount of them. It just makes it easier and it keeps everything consistent when you do it like this. Under US GAAP, you could technically still not count operating leases as debt, but if you do that, you have to be really careful with your metrics and ratios and use consistent ones based on your method. Finally, with returns-based metrics, you need to be really careful with return on invested capital and return on capital employed. And when you use them, make sure the interest element is excluded from NOPAT. Even if the company doesn't recognize the lease expense in separate interest and depreciation components, you need to do that when you calculate these types of metrics so that you can compare this company properly to other companies in its set and to companies in other regions, for example. That's it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you have a better idea of how operating leases work under the accounting rules as of 2019 and how it changes some of the financial statement analysis and valuation rules.